Welcome to this side-by-side -side comparison of two of the leading game systems available to wargamers at the moment. The Battalion Combat series that has occupied my gaming table for a, at least the last three or maybe four years. Uh, I've done three videos on it. I am scripting another four at the moment. I am really immersed and excited and looking forward to the next editions. There are something like four in various states of design at the moment. The Grand Tactical series, many moons ago, I played a game of No Question of Surrender, which I enjoyed. And last week, I spent six happy days in a hotel with my friends playing Race for Bastogne and being fully immersed in the system. And naturally, when wargamers get together and play a big complicated game, they, well, they drink beer and they talk nonsense, but they also review the game and they assess it and they go, well, what does that work? And I like how that does that. And then they start to compare and contrast with other games that they're super enthusiastic about. And I wanted to take that discussion that we had and reflect on it a little bit more and give you and myself an opportunity to really appreciate what these games do well, how they stack up against each other, and how to think about them as models, models of military history. The big picture, of course, is how lucky are we? Two great game systems, roughly at the same level. Grand Tactical is at the company level and wider formations. BCS is at the Italian level, obviously, and wider formations. Well supported, exciting new designs are coming out. They are released fairly regularly. You know, it's a treasure trove of gaming experiences for us. And it has a long history. I wasn't aware of Panzer Command back in 1984, or if I was, I've long since forgotten, but it was the antecedent for the Grand Tactical series. And that has been chugging out excellent games all the way through. For some reason, I was a bit snooty about it. My friends seem to have had enormous fun, particularly with Devil's Cauldron and Where Eagles Dare. And I don't know, I was late to the party. And I was also interested in the release of the Company Scale System, which is a very, very close cousin, published by Clash of Arms. Well, sort of there. So I have Montelemar, I have Little Land, I have Greatest Day, and I have Race for Bastogne, and I have all of the combat, the Battalion Combat series. So I'm really interested in how the game designers create these immersive experiences for us and solve, I think, some of the big game design problems. So, of course, number one is they have to be fun. Immersive, amusing, challenging, replayable games that, you know, you and I commit days and days and days to learning and then playing. And I think both of them easily pass that test without <laughs> any trouble whatsoever. Secondly, I think as a game design problem, or as a war game design problem, there is a question of verisimilitude. One of my favourite words. Verisimilitude is the quality of being real. Now, obviously war games are not real war, that would be crass. But war games should, for me at least, be like reading a military history book. Reading a campaign unfold, looking at the maps, feeling the story of the various constraints and opportunities and decisions. And a war game is like your own military history book that you write. And for me, BCS wins this. It doesn't crush BTS by any means, but it certainly wins this. Next is what I've called ants abuse. For all of you old enough to remember dear old Europa and the site of motorized police battalions being way off in the lead, well, well further forward than any of the Panzer divisions, you will understand that problem where every unit is like every other unit, and so there's no constraints or reasons why they should operate in any kind of realistic way. ASL, I believe, has a similar problem in that you can kind of move the units any which way that you like. There's, there's no command structure, there's no logistics, there's nothing around it. I mean, they're both 1980s games and they, you know, I still have a couple of Europas down in my cupboards 
and I had quite a few bits of ASL, but they, they don't have this modern, more sophisticated quality, despite ASL's dedication to what tanks have rear-facing machine guns and all the minutiae of uh, the hardware. Don't shoot me if you disagree, but I'd love to hear your opinions. And I think both GTS and BCS manage this really, really well. They give you this tiered level of you, the formations, the subformations, the units to deal with and put realistic constraints around them. And then finally, balance. This has several characteristics, so game time balance. Am I sat there for a couple of hours whilst my friend does their turn, looking up the ceiling and trying not to be bored? You know, is there enough to and fro and interaction between the two or four of us as we play these games? Secondly, victory conditions. Is there a balance that we both have a realistic chance of winning? And finally, attacking and defending. Do we both get to have an attack? Do we both get to defend? There are plenty of games where you fundamentally have to be the side that's the defender and just get your head kicked in, oh, turn after turn after turn. And, you know, I can do that for a day. I can do that for several days. But, you know, for a week of gaming, oof, you know, I believe that BCS and GTS are great on the first two of these. And in terms of attack and defense, BCS is the winner for me, in part because that's a very deliberate design decision that they've taken. And I'll expand on that a little bit more. But I want to circle back to verisimilitude, because I think it's a bold claim to say that BCS is more real, that the rules make more sense in terms of military history. Uh, and that's important. It's important to me, at least, because if the rules didn't make sense in terms of some sort of military history, well, then it would just be a game. It wouldn't be a war game. And, you know, heaven knows, I love war games. We play little Euro games uh, in the evening when we're tired of the main event during the day. But I play war games because I wanted to have that military flavor. So let's unpack that a little bit more. I've created this scorecard of 12 different aspects of the game and try to think about each of the two game series in turn and how do they help us create an immersive military history gaming experience. So let's kick off with combat in the offense. And I've divided out offense and defense because the two different games have different qualities here. So in offense, I think BCS is really excellent. They have all these different types of units that can assist in all these combat or combat related activities. Um, it is, and I produced a couple of videos on this, I think the finest kind of rock, paper, scissors environment where different things, you know, the artillery is good at attacking the infantry, the armor is good at attacking other armor and so on, to create a proper combined arms flavor. Now, Dean Essek, the designer, is particularly interested in replicating maneuver warfare and so it's all about movement and it's all about the attack. GTS is a more traditional model. It's certainly not a bad one. It's better than most in fact. It uses various types of gun sizes from your rifle, from your small arms, up to your great big medium artillery and gives them different results on the combat results table, depending upon whether it's a soft target or an armored target. This does work reasonably well, but because they're all on the same table, it means that they're all slightly the same. So, for example, in my Race for Bastogne game, I had some Panther tanks sitting off a thousand meters away from some entrenched infantry, able to use their 75 millimeter guns to destroy the infantry unit. And, you know, that, that just didn't feel right. That shouldn't happen. That's not how tanks and infant, drug in infantry kind of interact. And BCS, I think, is much better at modeling that. However, in defense, I tip my hat towards GTS. This is partly a design decision on BCS's that because Dean is so offensive minded, so maneuver warfare minded, he very, very, very much downplays attritional warfare. 
he's not interested in slugfests and tries to avoid them. It means that in the game, defence is either quite brittle, and you get situations where, in military history, things lasted a lot longer or were more defensible. So I'm thinking, for example, of the frontier wire position in Brazen Chariots, the Operation Crusader game, which in the game is pretty easy to take down, but in the campaign lasted for weeks. Isolated, but certainly remained largely intact. And what BCS often does is create game-specific rules to cover the attritional part. So in Brazen Chariots, it has locked formations that don't do anything. In Panzer's Last Stand, it only has a limited number of formations who can activate, and the other ones do nothing quietly. Um, it's fine as a design decision because it's not what they're interested in, but it does mean that defense is downplayed in my opinion. Now GTS, the experience of driving the Volksgrenadier Division forward, cross ferries up against the American Infantry Division that was uh, reasonably well entrenched and trying to winkle them out was really hard. And the difference is that the combat results table in BCS will either be with retreats or a step loss. In GTS, they have cohesion hits and they have suppression and then eventually they will have a step loss. So it's a much more graduated thing, which means it's harder to overcome the defense in the GTS, which in strongly defended situations is a much more satisfying experience. Command. Tip of the hat to both of them. They both are actually quite good at this. I give it to BCS, but they both avoid the, I'm the commander, and then I can move all of my units anywhere I like, the kind of Europa problem. GTS does this through dispatch points, which move a formation, and command points, which move a unit, or gets the unit to do something special, constrained by leaders within whose range you must operate. And that's pretty elegant, and, you know, was developed before BCS. BCS, I think, takes this further forward and makes the formations into a through combined arm teams with different elements fulfilling different things, with the abilities of limited intelligence and logistics, of combat fatigue, of commanding units in a way by just setting objectives. It, it all works to make you not be able to do everything all the time. So you have to do what really matters. You have to plan. You have to be a commander. In GTS, there's some level of that, but you can still go off in lots of different directions if you need. In Control, BCS wins again. Um, GTS, I think, has a fairly straightforward zone of control terrain system, and that element certainly exists in BCS. But in BCS, you have a lot more different types of units with a lot more different types of control from classic zones of control to support, which is a genius mechanism for taking units that were classically support and penny packing and penny packeting them in all the units. So anti-tank. Anti-tanks didn't fight as one great big clump. They gave anti-tank assets to lots of little camp groups or beefed up individual battalions. The use of engagements to replicate long range fire and then screening as a sort of territorial ter um, control to make people slower just creates a much more intricate web of how the battle space is dominated by your units. Communications, again, is another BCS winner. BTS doesn't really have communication issues aside from sequencing formations. So in Rest Bastogne, there is some quite constricted terrain. If you want to move into a column, you have to move your whole formation down a road. And if you mix your formations, you can get into a bit of traffic problems. There certainly is traffic in BCS, particularly if you use the optional tr unit traffic rule, which I recommend. But there's a whole concept of your supply line going back, your Glock ground lines of communications. And there are penalties for mixing them up. 
mixing up the formation, mixing up your supply line. And so it gives you a sense that, yes, I can abuse it. I can run too many units down a road, but if I do, it's going to impact me operationally, which I think is really elegant. Logistics is also a BCS winner. GTS doesn't really do logistics, or I suppose more fairly, it subsumes logistics under formation activations and the use of command points to push things along, but you never really get uh, any kind of shortages. BCS, I think, is a better logistics model. I mean, in fairness to both, they both avoid the kind of classic supply points pushing forward accountancy kind of uh, logistics model. BCS takes the view that the problem isn't not having enough supply. The problem is your formations running out of your uh, logistics network and the ability to receive supply. If your headquarters goes too far, then your combat train has to go into ghost. If you're running several divisions down the same road, that will impact you. It will degrade your ability to activate your formation. And if you really get chopped up in both your communications and your logistics net quite seriously, if your units run out of command, then they will struggle to receive supplies and will suffer the effects of isolation, which will increase the worst mess you've made of your logistics and your communications. And again, it, it, it's relatively simple as a set of rules, but really elegant. Next up, intelligence, which I also award to PCS. In many ways, this isn't intelligence, this is kind of anti-intelligence because we are like gods. Oh, I am. We can see everything across the tabletop. It's very difficult to have a kind of fog of war rules other than, you know, you can only see the first combat unit in the stack and that kind of thing. GTS doesn't really address this. I mean, there were some anti-intelligence moments mainly caused by the number of column markers that we had to put on our rapidly advancing units, which then led to, well, which, where's this unit and all that kind of thing, but that's not really the same. BCS works really hard to reduce your godlike abilities. You know, this is Rommel sitting on a wooden box trying to look through a telescope to see what's going on. You don't know if your formation is going to activate. You don't know how much of the activation you'll get. Will it be full? Will it be partial? You don't know if they're going to get a second activation. You don't know if these activation activities are going to fatigue you, which is going to make further future activations more difficult until you uh, do a recovery. You don't know necessarily the order in which they're going to activate. And that's true of GTS as well, which is a, an excellent thing. BCS actually has several different types of activations that you can choose from depending on the game and your personal preference. You don't even know where things like HQs and combat trains for your opponents are really located. So you can't micromanage your planning. You can't create a sort of ballet. This unit goes here, two, three, and then it comes around there, which, you know, is all to the four. Uh, I think is brilliant. And when combined with both combat mechanisms, which stop you from doing your classic, well, I'll count up my combat factors and your defense factors, and then look on the CRT and, oh, look, I can get a three to one or a six to one. Therefore, the probability is definitely that I'm going to get this or that kind of results. All of that is taken away in both of these games, but I particularly enjoy the way that BCS limits your godlike view. Engineering. Now, engineering, I think, in GTS is excellent. It provides a real flavor. You have all sorts of engineering tasks and engineering units represented in the game. In part, that's a reflection of its slightly lower level. And in part, I think it's a design decision on the part of BCS to say, largely, in the time frames of these battles, engineering activities take too long and are done before the battle commenced, particularly because these battles are primarily about movement and attack. So in BCS, your engineering units are either 
horrible construction units like this who barely know which end of a rifle to hold, or classic assault engineers like this pioneer battalion. And interestingly, these pioneer battalions are rendered as slightly worse than the mainstream infantry, which goes against the grain for several games in which uh, assault engineers are kind of like superheroes. They, you know, have access to all sorts of, you know, weird and wonderful flamethrowers and, and explosive charges and can do wonderful things and have excellent morale and kind of get used as super infantry. I don't know if they've been slightly downgraded to avoid that problem because, of course, well, yes, they can do that kind of stuff, but they're also super highly skilled people and you don't want to waste them, bludgeoning them in excessive combat use because they are just too useful. Anyhow, engineering for GTS, also artillery for GTS. In BCS, artillery is largely abstracted out and I sort of understand why artillery is so devastating when it hits that it's quite hard to incorporate within a game. Most of the artillery fire is wasted by missing. So what it's used for here is it helps attacks and it stiffens up defense and prepared defense. And you can do barrages, which will reduce the resilience of unit by taking down steps. But in the main, it has an important but not dominating factor. The things that artillery spend a lot of time doing, which is counter battery fire, is just, you know, under the table, so to speak. So in GTS, they have a much more sophisticated model. These artillery parks are really interesting where you have to be in contact or not in contact. It is a key defensive and offensive tactic to use your artillery barrages wisely. Wise Guy History on his channel has an excellent video on the tactics of using barrages. I recommend it to you. So I, you know, for me, it's sort of some interesting concepts. We didn't do the counter battery fire in our Race for Bastogne game, and possibly because it was too unfamiliar for us, but also because we were racing. And so a, a more static position didn't arise until towards the very end of the game where counter battery fire would become a thing, but it is super important. Next up, attack and counterattack. So this is this is a situation rather than a quality of the game, but the, the games are both designed to explore certain situations. And for BCS, attack and counterattack is absolutely what it's interested in. They want a chance for both sides to attack. They to you know provide a, a, an entertaining experience in that. And they also want to chime with the whole maneuver emphasis, warfare emphasis of the game. Hence, their games are concentrated on relief operations like Panzer's Last Stand or Kalich, which is a design in preparation, the attempted relief of Stalingrad. They look at failed offensives where you attack and then it gets pushed back, such as Last Blitzkrieg, which is the Battle of Bulge, and Baptism by Fire, which is Kasserine. And they look at fluid situations like Brazen Chariots, which is Operation Crusader in the desert, and Aracor, which is fighting in northern France in 1944. And so they're very keen to provide this balanced gaming experience and, and succeed. On the other hand, the situation of invasions and large-scale power drops is where GTS has focused the bulk of its attention and does this really, really well. And I salute them for that because there are a number of games that try and include invasion and power drop rules on, and they just add sort of complexity and they aren't really integrated into the game very well. Whereas in GTS, I think they are integrated very, very realistically. They focus obviously on invasions and large scale power drops, treats the two games on Market Garden, the two games to be on D Day, the three games on the uh, Pacific Islands. And they also Tackle situations of tenacious defense like Bastogne and Bir Hakim in uh, North Africa. And I think that's a very unusual and unique gaming experience. And it certainly amused my gaming friends uh, greatly. And they are well up for uh, playing some more GTS because of that exciting situation that it uh, provides. Finally, randomness. So there's a little bit of a Goldilocks thing here. Too random 
And it's like, you know, what I, why am I sitting here? I, I don't know what on earth's going to happen next. To constrained, and it becomes patterned and mechanistic and subject to perfect play. You know, I, I used to love Pog Pass to, uh, to Victory, the First World War card game. And then people started to learn the perfect sequence of cards to play. And, you know, it spoiled it for me, which was a, a shame. BCS is probably more random in its core game. It's kind of integral randomness to it. GTS certainly has some randomness, particularly in the uh, activation of your formations. But I do like GTS's special random rules, certainly in Race for Bastogne, your ability to roll and get things like heroes and surrender of surrounded units uh, and bonus intelligence would give you extra command points, I thought was really nicely done. There's a balance between Chrome rules when they get just silly, you know, little light planes, flying bazookas. I'm sorry, guys, Aracor did not need that rule. And ones that add, oh, an unexpected point of interest. And GTS, I think, did that very, very well. And so those are the 12 aspects that I've sought to look at. BCS, for me, leads in these places. That's not to say that GTS is bad, but G BCS, I think, has added something new and different and interesting and very satisfying in the way that they model military history through their game. And GTS has led in these ones with a combined score of BCS winning, but GTS certainly not in any way humbled. And if you add that to my earlier thoughts about what was the overall problem that these games were trying to solve, you get a score of, of this. Little bonus I thought of just as I was going to shoot this. It's more a graphic design problem than a, uh, a military history modeling problem. We are all so familiar for the last, what, 25 years of OCS and BCS style maps. This is Kassering Pass uh, over here, very brown because it's the desert, but you know, they are a model of clarity and straightforwardness. I do, however, really like. GTS's hex and dot system, it makes it less, less noise and the dots just make it perfectly clear. Yes, this hex here is a wood hex, this hex here isn't, even though it has a bit of wood in it. It allows for a more naturalistic map representation whilst retaining absolutely pin sharp accuracy. Both are excellent. Bravo to the, uh, to the designers of both. And that's it for me. Thank you for watching. This is just my opinion. I would love to hear your opinion. You know, have I missed anything? Have I misrepresented anything? Or indeed got the wrong end of the stick? It's, it's one of my superpowers. Or is just your experience different from mine? I'll be putting a little poll into the community tab of this YouTube channel, and I'll be posting the video on the Facebook groups and on Consum World. Love to hear what you think. Hope you found this interesting. Thanks for watching. Stay safe.